we've, um, we've had multiple conversations and I feel like it's been such a pleasure talking with these two and uh, I, th I feel like we'll, we'll all be sad when this conference is over because we won't have scheduled, you know, check-ins with each other. So I want I know you guys have bios in your uh, booklets, but I also wanted to just say a few things that aren't in the bios in the booklets. So Susie Gonch is an artist, associate professor, and head of the medals program at VCU in Richmond, Virginia. She's a first-generation Hungarian-American. She's a geology major. Uh, or she was a ge geology major in college and is now the president-elect of Ethical Metalsmiths and the director of Radical Jewelry Makeover. Currently, she's in the middle of a three-month residency at the Kohler factory and is working for the first time in ceramics. <laughs> Amos Paul Kennedy Jr. is a letterpress printer based in Detroit and was his mother's favorite child. <laughs> this is true. He was a math major in college and had a successful career as a systems analyst for AT&T before he discovered letterpress printing on a trip to Colonial Williamsburg at the age of 40. And he's never looked back. Most recently, he was named a Glasgow Fellow in Craft from the United States Artists and is currently in the process of renovating a studio in Detroit called The Printing Plant. So today we're talking about process in the conventional sense of the word, how something is made. And we're gonna look at process in a more expansive way and how it can transcend traditional boundaries. <clears throat> we wanna examine how making, documentation, and teaching have changed since the time we all graduated from school about 20 years ago. We have differences to the, in the degree to which we've adopted digital technologies and the degree to which we teach but more importantly, what's interesting is that we've all ended up with similar concerns and that the ultimate focus or message of our work um, is uh, there are so many parallels, I feel like. And I also feel like that's no coincidence. I feel like in a lot of ways, we're sort of um, product of our times. Mm -hmm. So um, the first question I wanna start with is a really basic one because I feel like a lot of people uh, might not know what all of us do. And so I wanna just start with uh, asking you guys to describe your process of making and also just um, teasing out three things that you're in love with in, in regards to process. Well, unfortunately, I got a call from my lawyer last night and my process is proprietary information. And since, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, therefore I'm unable to share it because uh, it would, you know, I'm afraid someone would actually steal it. <laughs> but in reality, uh, I thought about process, and there is this uh, principle in quantum mechanics called the uncertainty theorem, or uncertainty principle, that if you have two complementary things, you can know one but not the other. Like you can know the momentum of an uh, electron but not the position. And I feel that way about talking about the process. I can either do it or I can talk about it. But I can't, you know, and talking about it is not really the process. It's just the reflection. And as we all know, we make things up the more we say it. You know, um, I think Tito yesterday talked about the, uh, the program at Mayo where people were told to explain the accident, and each time the story got more in line. So there's something about the memory. The more you talk about it, the more it conforms to this. And so it's hard for me to talk about my process. I can tell you that uh, a lot of times it begins with uh, a ritual of smoking marijuana to open up my mind. And despite what people say, you know, I write down my notes and they're even more brilliant the next day. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, from there I take that and I go into the studio and think, well, actually it's shop, and then things happen, you know. Mm -hmm. And I just, the, the shop kind of tells me, I think there's a conversation between the equipment in the shop and myself and all the experiences that I've had. Yeah, well one, one way you've described it in the past is to talk about process as the sort of meta-material. Yes, 
And, and well, the thing is, is that I've been listening to these conversations, and I realize that I am not alone because um, I am part of a, the collective, human collective. And so when I am what people think you are alone, you are actually in the presence of all the humanity. And all the forces of humanity are playing upon you. Yeah. And so this is, you know, this is the sort of thing that uh, I, I kind of come from. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of things that, uh, that influence me. But it's kind of hard for me to pinpoint exactly, you know, like A, B, C, D. It's the experience. It's the doing. It is the act of creation. And I think that's what we all like to do. That's what all human beings like to do. They like to create. And that process varies as much as the human beings vary. Yeah. And I think you see that in my work because no two of my posters are the same. I don't want to ignore Susie, but I just want to, uh, I just want to give you, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Here's a follow-up question. Like, what is, the, what is the thing that you love about the material? So uh, one thing I know is that when you saw that printer at Colonial Williamsburg, you fell in love with that process. Well, I like letters. I sincerely believe that because the book is such an iconic part of Western civilization, that it has been fused into our DNA. So you have people who have to be booksellers. You have people who have to write. You have people who want to be printers. And I think that, you know, when I saw that, it was like this was the connection with my DNA, that I want to stamp m marks on paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Susie? Is it my turn? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> You know, what, what you said, Amos, was really resonant with me. Like, there's a certain um, amount of uh, vulnerability and, and indescribability to a studio practice, right? And um, so to intellectualize it is so difficult in yeah. some ways, you know? But I, I have been thinking about that question a lot, and, you know, I, I know that I... I'm trained as a metalsmith and a jeweler, and I really look at the world through that lens. And I, you know, everything is analyzed based on connections, you know, hot and cold connections. Mm. And so knowing that, um, it's easy to see how my work has translated from jewelry and metalsmithing into other materials. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I, I collect things. Um, sometimes I generate those collect things that I collect, I make them, but then to connect myself to the world outside my studio and to things that concern me, I collect from my community, or I collect my own trash, you know, and I use that. Do you walk to system. school? Do you collect trash on the way to school? Heck yeah. You're always, like, looking yeah, at Yeah, my search. backpack is always, Erica could open my backpack and find <laughs> my collection right now. You know, like, I'm always collecting stuff, and yeah. it, I find that those materials are so... What's, valuable. The, what's the difference between a good piece of trash and a bad piece of trash? Oh, that's easy. You know, a good piece of trash has uh, the residue of the person on it. You know, that's to it. me, that yeah. becomes a metaphor of our our collective um, experience. You know, yeah. the decisions that we've made as a society. Mm. Um, and that I weave into my, my work, wow. you know. That I'm kind of germaphobic, so I'm fascinated by that. <laughs> oh, I, I totally won't lie to you. There is some gross stuff yeah. that I've collected where I'm like, okay, that one goes in the trash. Yeah. Um, but I, I do, I, I really appreciate that collection, you know, and then, and then figuring out what's the appropriate connection for that to create a system that, that results in a piece. You know, so how do you figure out how to connect a material that has properties that are so different from metal, right? So, like, how do you connect two plastic bags? How do you connect clay? Do you, do you want to make connections that are visibly, that look, have some kind of reference to metal? Well, I don't know if everyone would connect uh, or associate metal with what I'm doing, but, like, I look at, like, I know, um, like the coffee lids that I'm connecting, you know, how can I rivet a coffee lid? 
I mean, those of you that know what a rivet is, you know that it involves a hammer, it involves metal, you know, but a coffee lid, I can't do that. So what else can I use? You know, I use a, so I came up with a, a price tagging gun. It's a rivet. Yeah. You know, and so I'm, I really and think. And it's totally brilliant because it's appropriate to that material. Right. Metal wouldn't work in that yeah. situation. And so even sewing, like to me, this is this the same as a solder seam, but in, in, in cloth? Yeah. You know, so I really, that's how I look at things, you uh -huh. know? Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Um, I think for me, when I, I mean, the th interesting th thing that's happened for me is that um, I've taken my, the documentation of my main medium and made that um, part of my work. So my process <coughs> has become my work, mm -hmm. right? There's like all the clay stuff that I do, but I'm so kind of in love with the camera and uh, taking a photograph and then manipulating that thing in the camp in the computer, you know, and editing video is like that's my new love. I feel like I feel so kind of content when um, that's what I have. That's like my morning chore. There's mm -hmm. something really wonderful about that. I think. Yeah. yeah. So, can you guys talk a little bit about um, how you make decisions in the studio? So. You know, like how much of it is predetermined? Um, how much is purely intuitive? And and how's your practice changed in in the last twenty years? Uh, you want to go first? I went first last time. Um, <laughs> well, um, I, you know, my work has evolved in the sense that I I I. It used to be really tight where, you know, I used to have the lineup of dividers measured out to the millimeter and I would draft everything very um, rigidly, you know, and I would follow that map and construct what I was making, you know, and things would uh, go go wrong in the process. I'd problem solve that, sure. But I, I Would you problem knew. solve it to continue on the same path, the yes. same trajectory? Yeah. Yeah. But now, I, I, it almost left not enough room. As I evolved, I needed more room for discovery or more room for risk, more room for failure. And I, I'm not using the word failure in a negative sense, but in, in the sense of like, huh, there's, a, there's something going on here. How can I, how can I actually catch that thing? Like where, that thing became the most interesting part, you know, where I had to actually uh, solve something. You know, if I drafted everything perfectly, it was solved before I made it. There was something that died for me in that work. And so. Um, What's an example of that? Mm, well, even, uh, you guys wouldn't see it, it's not in the images, but even the piece called Falling in Love in 1999, that piece was drafted pretty accurately. I knew exactly what was going to happen with it, how it would react when I made it. And sure enough, I constructed it, it was done. Mm. You know, and so I wanted there to be room for me, mm -hmm. you know, for something else that would be, I don't know, um, intuitive to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I needed to be the mouse, I needed to be that, that cat throwing the toy mouse mm -hmm. and pouncing on it. Mm -hmm. I needed that distance to be further. Yeah. You know, and so it I've really evolved to have more room in my practice for that kind of reaction in the studio you know like it well and luckily you're working with clay which is like oh the most kind of unpredictable material god it kind of you know i love it i mean i'm working in repetition yeah uh, pretty intensely now because i'm generating these multiples which is another story but um man that clay is <laughs> she talks to me you know like <laughs> sometimes She's too soft, sometimes she's too hard. You know, and I, I'm a metalsmith, so I'm metalsmithing it. You know, I'm, I'm sanding mean? it, I'm using my wet dry abrasive paper, I, you know, I'm using the tools as I would use my saw, my file, and I notice how the material's reacting to me. It's like, no, use your finger, not your file. Use yeah. your, you know, there's, use the sponge, not the abrasive paper, or, you know. 
So I'm really learning in that in that way. The repetition is so great. Like I feel so awake. Yeah. You know, like it really. Wakes and have you had pieces go through the whole firing process? I have fired once. I did some tests. Um, I took them out of the kiln just two days ago, actually. Uh, and I don't even know how to judge them based on anything else. Like, I, I need to fire more so that I can see what's happening. Yeah. Because um, I was really interested in that collaborative process of the kiln. I know, I know that I'm rambling like right now, but there's this, like, how does the kiln collaborate with what I'm making? And so the things that I got out so far are only one generation of that. So I need something to compare and push on. Right. I don't, I mean, you probably. It's like you're the scientist it. working with elephants instead of fruit flies, right? Like it takes a really long time yeah. to like figure out what's actually happening and like where the mistakes are happening early on in the process. Absolutely, and I think you know it, where I am in my own studio practice now without clay, I have this trained eye, right? So I can see instantly like, oh, there's a stitch off right there, you know. Yeah. But in clay, I'm like, it all looks fine to me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it all yeah. looks good so far. Yeah. You know? You'll see it next year sometime. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's super interesting to have um, such a facility with mud material and bring that to, and I feel like we're seeing that in contemporary art, right? We, yeah. we have artists that are um, painters or, you know, working with some other material that are working with clay for the first time, and there's a, there's a way in which they're working with it that feels like really fresh and new to, to, to somebody who's been working with clay for a long time because they've never seen somebody make mistakes like that before. I think it's amazing because it, it brings a vulnerability that it is at once really uncomfortable, but that vulnerability and that naivety is really, um, I feel like it's a total gift right now to yeah. feel so uh, in such a foreign territory. Yeah. You know, um, it's not comfortable. But I, I feel really fortunate to yeah. have the opportunity, you yeah. know? Yeah. Amos, what about you? What about me? What? What's the question? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I got engrossed in the answer. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the question is, describe your process of decision making in the studio. And I'm curious oh, yeah. about, I mean, be, because you need to, to some degree, you're, you need to know what um, you're printing, right? right? I mean, you're choosing your words. And then at what point does, uh, well, what happens? Take over. Okay, what happens is that uh, I find text that I want to print. Then after I find text that I want to print, a subject matter normally. And once I find the subject matter, I am really into uh, aphorisms, proverbs, maxims. So I go out and then I find um, maxims, proverbs, aphorisms around that subject matter. Well, and what's the difference for you between using? Uh, somebody else's words and using your own words. Uh, they have their words sell better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my brilliant ideas are only brilliant to me. You know, <laughs> and so uh, I, a long time ago, I kind of gave up doing uh, doing texts that I go out and sell. Yeah. Things that I do personally. So I have another press that I call now the Black Cat Press, and that's uh, more of a political press. And I do a lot of uh, pro bono work around Detroit. Mm. And so normally the work that I do uh, pro bono and just to kind of, I'm into this sort of, I call it non-graffiti where I will leave a stack of cards with a message at a coffee shop or at a bookstore, you know, any place where they hand out the free flyers. Yeah, and so, Is yes. there, do, you ever, do you ever hear a conversation and then, and then use that? You know, like when you're walking down the street, do you ever like, oh, that's the thing I'm gonna say? To no, you. I haven't done that yet, but I, that is something that I'll probably grow into. You know, I've heard people will talk to me and then I say, I'm gonna steal that, you know. And then normally if somebody gives me a quotation or a saying, I give them a, ser a part of the uh, series that I do. Mm -hmm. But after I get the text, then, uh, then the magic really begins because I just go into my shop and I think that, uh, I tell people that the press tells me what to do. And I, and I have, if you lower your expectations, you meet them. <laughs> Therefore, keep your expectations low. And I try to keep mine low. One time somebody said, well, how do you go about designing your, your 
uh, you know, posters. I had a sheet of paper and I drew a rectangle and I said, I put, I put it right there. You know, that's all I know. I have a rectangle of paper and I'm gonna put something on it. And uh, as I go through the process, the process builds and it tells me, you know, maybe I should shift this. Because I don't do addition work, I will change everything in the middle of a run and just add things on. Mm -hmm. The reason I got into layering is because I have this problem with spelling. And uh, like a good doctor, I like to bury my mistakes under layers of text. And it also looks good. And so uh, when I started doing that, I realized that I could change the color. I could change the layout mm -hmm. because it's all part of that. And I really adhere to the philosophy that uh, the snowflake no two snowflakes are the same. No two human beings are the same. So why do I want to have this monoculture? Why do I want to have everything perfectly the same? Mm -hmm. You know, perfect is the enemy of great. And you know, so I like to, uh, and also again, you keep your standards low, you meet them, you're happy. A lot of people have very high standards, they don't meet them, and then they get, you know, they go into depression or they go into a block and say, you know, I just can't make it happen. But every day I leave the shop and I'm just giddy because, you know, I, you know, I put the ink on the paper. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> you make it sound so easy. It is. <laughs> it's not hard. It's just, you know, it's fun. That's what it is. I mean, the thing is, it's like right now there's this whole thing about play. And we are, you know, we're going to study play and we're going to interject play into the workforce. Mm -hmm. But... Play is play. You can't study play. You play play. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you ask the child how do they play, they don't say, well, you know, to well, begin with playing, I do this, and then I have to have this environment. They just go outside and play. Yeah. You know, it's when there's a, there's a point where you're no longer playing because you have a set of rules that you're following. You know, it's like, oh, they say play baseball, but when you have a little kid, you know, they'll run around the base four or five times. You know, yeah. because they're playing, you know, but yeah. then we say you can only run around once. Then you stop the play, mm -hmm. and it becomes, you know, something more formal. Mm -hmm. I think play is really, you know, if you, if you try to play, you don't play. Yeah. You know, there's, yeah, there's this craze for improv right now, right? And the first tenet of improv is yes and. I feel like this is what we do, right? I mean, I sort of learned it as what if. Right. But it's, it's the same thing. And that seems like that's what's happening as you, as you start something. Absolutely. And, I mean, how, how um, much do you have to really pay attention to the sort of rules of letterpress? Like, do you have to wait for the ink to dry? Can you, can you just keep going? I mean, at what point, like, where does craftsmanship fit into that for you? You know, when I was in graduate school, uh, the person that I studied most under was Walter Hamity. And Walter Hamity said that the answers to a lot of questions are, it depends. And then it also depends on the outcome you want. If you want it to be dry, then you let it dry. Mm -hmm. But if you want, if, uh, if you put one ink on top of another ink, it'll pull away. And so you get, there's something called viscosity in inks. And so it will pull away from it. If you want that effect, then you print wet. If you don't want it, you let it dry completely. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what you want. Yeah. You know, and that's one of the things that uh, I think people have to realize is that there are as many ways to solve a problem as there are people in the world. If I don't, I mean, there are people that we call fine printers that only print in black with a little bit of red on white paper and they print most beautifully. But I don't want to print that way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like what, you know, I will print wet, I will print, and you know, a, a, something that print, you learn when you take a printmaking course, and I'm not a printmaker, is that you never put black ink into a white ink can. But that doesn't make me any difference because I just need some ink right then, so I don't, you know, I just, I, you know, I just do what I want to. And if you don't like it, that's not my problem. Mm -hmm. You know, that's your problem. <laughs> I like that. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>
Well. <laughs> I know. Okay. We're yeah, through. <laughs> the process is do what you want as long as you want to. That's the process. <laughs> <laughs> Traditionally, crafts been organized by medium, and I'm wondering if we can use craft to better define who we are as makers, right? Like, is process really just a way of life, a kind of identity? Because we all work in different, right? We have like the yeah. we have a studio life. We have different materials that we work with, and then we have we are all engaged in some kind of community outreach, right? Right. So well, they're, they're blurred boundaries. And that's the thing is that I believe Western civilization is one of the great faults of Western civilization is that we attempt to put everything in nice little boxes. And that's the way we can explain the world, putting everything into nice little boxes. But the world is not nice little boxes. Mm -hmm. The world is the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that the way we should understand it is that it is this wholeness and we are part of this wholeness. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, I'm getting to the point now where I just tell people I'm a human being. You're like, what do you do? I'm a human being. Let you figure that out. Well, what is a human being? Wait, you know, you're a human being. That's what I do what you do. I just do it differently. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's really true. You know, I, I think um, it's come up a little bit in this conference that um, less and less do we want to be categorized, right? Do, you know, I'm a human being, I'm a jeweler, I'm a metalsmith, I'm an artist, I'm a sculptor, I do, I engage in social uh, community-based practice, I teach, I, on and on and on. Yeah. Which box do I check right now? Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and I, I, I don't see a division between all those things. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I think it's important for who I am. It makes me who I am. Yeah. You know, and I think the complexity of that um, is important. It makes life interesting. Yeah. You know, um, it calls me to action or it calls me to inaction. You know, is that a word, inaction? Um, you know, it, it makes us, it motivates me. Can we label your 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 um, tag problem solver? Yeah, that would be the best. Yeah. Susie Conch. No, problem I think solver. we ought to label them human. <laughs> yeah. no, I'm just human. That's all. I mean, I just did a I did a body of work for an exhibition at the Center for Book Arts, and the title of it is "I Am Negro," and so it's this big "I Am Negro," and then underneath it says "I Am Mother," another one says "I Am Father," another one says "I Am Bi," another one says "I Am Gay," you know just because this is what we are, yeah. you know? And then one says, I am human, you know? Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, we're all humans. You know, that is what binds us together. That is what defines us, our humanity. When I deny someone their humanity, I am denying my humanity. And I do not want to deny my humanity. I want my humanity to grow and to spread mm -hmm. because we are good things. We are good animals on this planet. And the only way that that can really occur is by being generous, and generosity really defines humans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think part of um, what, it just sounds funny, but I feel really inspired by your overalls. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, that sounds like a weird segue, but um, this is what Amos wears. He wears pink um, button downs and overalls. And I feel like there's a way in which it's not like, it's not a costume that's shed at the end of the day. This is like he's take, it's, it's a political statement. And I find that it's, I feel like it's a very sort of brave act. And I feel like I want to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, again, you know, like the process, process is living. And so you do that every day. You do that all the time. And why stand there and say, let me examine my process. Why don't you just do your process? Yeah. The only way you get better is by doing. You don't get better by, you know, you can get better through examining. And there are times that you want to be introspective. But really, you get better by doing. Mm -hmm. Because as you do, you think about it. I come from a school of thought that theory comes from practice. 
Practice doesn't come from theory. And so by doing it, you know, I come up with these half-baked ideas that are fully formed when I go home at night and take my medicinal. That's one reason why I moved to Michigan is because marijuana is legal there as a medicine, and I use it to foster my creativity because lack of creativity is a medical condition. <laughs> I think we, we all need a little of that medicine. <laughs> yeah. Pass us the medicine, Amos. <laughs> um. FYI, you can fly with marijuana. TSA doesn't stop you. Really? Yeah. But this is a good tangent. <laughs> Everyone's taking notes here, right? <laughs> Until pretty recently, the modernist tenet of truth to materials or honesty to process has had a really heavy hand in cra studio craft. A kind of morality, a right way and a wrong way to do things, which were informed and reinforced bo by both the Bauhaus and Japanese philosophy. And I think one thing we're seeing now is this shift away from the object, away from craftsmanship and material beauty, which I'm not saying those things aren't important, but I'm also feeling like it's not enough anymore. I mean, I, I feel like all three of us um, in our practices have sought out more than um, wanting to make a discrete object that's for display. Um, and that what's lending value now to objects is this kind of social connection, right? Like the impact on a relationship or revealing some kind of uh, social injustice. Mm -hmm. So. What I want to know is uh, whether you feel an imperative to be part of contemporary discourse around difficult questions, um, and, that, and, and do we have a kind of civic duty to address these issues? Mm -hmm. I think it's a good question. I mean, I, I know for myself that how I want to participate in that conversation, but I, I can't speak for the we. You know, like, I think everyone determines what path they take to participation, right? Yeah. Um, but for myself, I, uh, I, I created and direct radical jewelry makeover because I think that objects can be imbued with layers, right? Like on the one hand, this is a beautiful ring. Yeah. On the other hand, it has political and political, socio-economic. Do you want to describe what it is, just for just a few words about it? Sure, i tell you the tagline. Yep. Okay. Radical jewelry makeover. It's a traveling, wait, a community traveling jewel, no. A <laughs> <laughs> wait, I was bring, really I bombing that on one. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, want me to Google it? It's a traveling community jewelry recycling and mining project. And so what we do is, we go into hosting communities at, that invite us, and we create a transparent supply chain within the jewelry industry where there largely is not one. I mean, there are ways now in the United States that you can trace materials directly to one mine, but it's, 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 there's one place that you can get that material now. You know, so it's not readily available to everybody. Um, but through recycling, we can actually trace that, okay, Amos donated uh, this material and uh, this artist made it into this material, this brooch or this piece of jewelry, and then it went out into the world and it's now worn by you. You know, so from his jewelry box to your neck. Or your finger. And people have all that whole backstory when they buy something? Yes. And that's really important. So now a piece of jewelry that I have on my hand, it, I know who made it. I know when it was made. I can look up in the records where that material came from. And that's really important. You know, so it becomes, um, it, in, it invites a conversation. You know, I think one of the reasons I designed the project is um, talking about political issues can be confrontational for people, right? Like it's not a comfortable conversation to talk about blood diamonds or hard rock mining as the dirtiest industry in the United States, right? Yeah. But how do you invite a conversation 
in a fun, you know, a, a fun non-confrontational way where we can get behind something that we share in common, a love of jewelry. Mm -hmm. And we can feel good about ourselves because we can take something and put it back into the industrial supply chain, you know, from your jewelry box where it's just sitting there, something that you're not wearing anymore, something that you're ready to give up. You know, yeah. and so it talks about the supply chain. It talks about, it celebrates artists, you know, the individuality of the maker, but then the collective and the collective Because it's a voice. collaborative process. Yeah, and it also, it, it also becomes, in my mind, a political act of making, you know, public making. So when there's, a, when there's an installment of RJM in a community, the community is invited in to come and watch and, and ask questions about the making process, you know. And then at the end of the process, there's an exhibition. And people who have donated jewelry come, and in some cases, they don't even have to purchase that piece based on their donation. And so there's a bit of a barter system there, and donors are meeting the jewelers, and they're sharing stories, mm. you know, and the donors are saying, hey, wait, that was that strange flower thing I donated. Look what someone did to it. You know, so there's this whole recognition of the supply chain. And for, for me, that became a really important and vital way to bring up concerns that I have about what I'm doing, you know, what I'm doing based on my choices in the studio. What you're doing, sourcing materials, but I feel like there's this uh, historical piece to it, which is you're, you might be taking family heirlooms. Right. And how do you make decisions around what to keep or not to keep? I mean, do you use everything that comes in? No. I mean, that, that's, another, that's another facet of the project that I think is in, interesting. That So I set up a system, right? This is the project. This is how it operates. Everybody that participates in the project brings expertise to the table, as far as I'm concerned. You know, even if you've never touched a piece of jewelry before, you might be um, helping with social media. You might be helping with something else, right? So everyone, and everyone has an opinion. So in cases like that, where we get a piece of jewelry, we, one year we had, um, I plucked out of the hands of a student who was sawing into a Ramon Puig, a mid-century mid modern Spanish jeweler, um, who, it, this piece was assessed in the sorting system, it went into the silver pile, and the student was like, hey, there's some silver, I'm gonna take that. You know, and I was like, um, let me take that. And, you know, I took it, I repaired it, I put it back together, and, and I feel like the obligation of the project is also to preserve pieces like that, that something like that needs to be in the home of somebody who's gonna love and cherish that. So now my job is to find a home for it, you know. Yep. Um, so not everything gets used. I also have a, a beautiful brooch. It's a, damaged a bit, but it has a woven hair. It's a, some Victorian morning jewelry that it, I mean, I've never seen anything so exquisite, mm. you know, and so that has to be preserved. It, it has to find the right home, yeah. you know. Yeah. So that part of the project I find really gratifying too because there's this preservation of of my field, you know, like of the heirlooms, mm -hmm. you know, the things that need to record our history, yeah. you know. Yep. Amos, recording history? Um, yes, everything you do kind of records history. And that's one thing about print. Print is, that's what it's about. But uh, what I do is I, I, I make a conscious attempt to put my work into the hands of as many people as possible. I have a price point that most people can afford, and I make multiples because uh, that is what I really want to do, is to, every human wants to decorate their environment. And they want to decorate it, I think, with something that has the human stamp on it. Yeah. Although the machine has taken over for the last hundred years. We're actually, we're, we're, we're over we're, time? No, we're not over time. We have a minute left. Okay, then finish. Are you kidding? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That was so fast. Yeah. I, I told you not to worry. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Wow. Go on. You, um, I uh, think uh, wrap it up. One thing about what you're saying <laughs> is that. Um, this, this idea of affordability about accessibility speaks to 
feel like what we all agree with is what um, needs to happen in terms of championing, championing craft is we need to put resources and time into K through 12 education. I know this is coming out of the blue, but we wanna just squeeze this in because I think we all feel really strongly that we wanna nurture a new generation of makers and that is uh, where we wanna, we wanna put an assignment out there to all of you because we have this incredible geographic diversity here in this audience. Um, and we want you to go back and put some energy into um, a, a kid's ed education. I mean, whether it's through the PTA or your local school board or whatever it is, um, whether it's going to a career day at your high school, it feels like we, we're in sort of desperate need of educating, um, sort of legitimizing art uh, and uh, making a sort of essential place for it in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Think of it this way. If you go to your local, to your career day, that is the little hinge. And you're the hammer that's going to knock it off to open up the floodgates so art can be everywhere in this nation. That is a good place.